Gary Zacharias again with the Apologist Bookshelf. I've got a brand new book, just came out, and I'm excited to take a look at it. It's actually a second edition of Christian Apologetics. That's the title by Doug Groteis. i got to make sure I pronounce that right. And uh, it's gotten some amazing reviews. Just to give you a quick idea, William Dembski, he says, uh, Gro- uh, Groteis is a master of Christian apologetics. He calls it a comprehensive guide. J.P. Morland says this is the go-to book in a Christian apologetics. Paul Copan, and I like Paul a lot too, he calls this book a substantive and immensely valuable resource. J. Warner Wallace, the cold case detective, he says it's a must-read for every Christian. Uh, One more, Sean McDowell says it's my go-to resource for people who want an introductory book on defending the faith. So you've got some all-stars there who are giving thumbs up to Christian apologetics. And I wanted to share with you a couple of things about the book first, and then I want to go to a particular chapter. So he, in his preface, Grotheis says, I owe the reader an account for why there's a second edition. So he spends time, which is good, every author should, uh, talk about why, why a new edition. And he said, I've added a section on sexual identity in light of recent LGBTQ concerns. He's added more on, um, let's see, seven new chapters on monotheism, because he said it really bothers him that there's a claim that first there was polytheism, and then over time, monotheism evolved. And so he takes on that. He said that's taught in so many religion classes. He adds more material, new material, on uh, an argument from beauty. He has a chapter that I want to focus on today that's new to this edition, Doubt, Skepticism, and the Hiddenness of God. And then he said he's added two chapters on the atonement, the atonement stating it properly and the atonement defending it. He said he started thinking about his first edition. He said it obviously argues and defends the orthodox understanding of the person of Christ, but not enough about the work of Christ as our Savior. So he's got something on that. He's also got uh, a section on in defense of the church. And the final new chapter, it's a great title, Lament as Christian apologetic. He says he argues there that Christianity equips the believer to suffer well and with meaning, which he says is actually an apologetic in among itself. So I'd like to start in by looking at chapter 20, Doubt, Skepticism, and the Hiddenness of God. Man, I'll tell you what... Uh, interested me in this is I've been listening to a Justin Brierley uh, episode of his Unbelievable show, and he actually had a show on the hiddenness of God with an atheist and a Christian talking about that. And uh, they, they pointed out in that show, by the way, if you ever a chance to listen to Unbelievable with Brierley, really, really interesting podcasts. But he, they came out of that show saying that a lot of people believe it's either the hiddenness of God can be explained either by the willful refusal of atheists to believe there's a God, or maybe God just simply has reasons for the hiddenness that we can't understand. So it's interesting because that's uh, where Grotheis is going to go as he talks about this. So here we are, chapter 20, Doubt, Skepticism, and the Hiddenness of God. And he said, as a start, I thought it was a great start, he said, He's made these arguments in earlier chapters for the existence of God and the reality of Christ. They said, you know, if those arguments are successful, then God is not hidden. He's evident in nature. He's evident in conscience, in history, in Jesus Christ, and in Scripture. But he said, you know, a lot of people, and he said he includes Christians in this, and he includes himself, that we have nagging doubts. Sometimes God just seems totally silent or totally absent. He said uh, we shouldn't necessarily feel like we're all alone. He mentions John the Baptist, and there's a great story. What an amazingly tough guy who stood up to all of the people of power back then. But when he was in jail, he had his doubts. He sent representatives to Jesus to ask him, are you really the Messiah? And so if John the Baptist can have doubts, uh, you know, all of us can. He says doubt comes really from a lot of different sources. Uh, Some are intellectual doubts. Some are just doubts that are emotional that we've gone through, and maybe some based on our situation. So he says, if you have good apologetics, that can soften or eliminate some of these doubts that we have as far as lack of knowledge or false beliefs. He 
mentions two good books, and I would recommend both of them. Just because of the authors, I haven't read either one, but he said the struggles of doubt are addressed in several volumes, and he says the best are two of these, God in the Dark, that's the interesting title, not God in the Dock, but God in the Dark by Oz Guinness, and I tell you, everything Guinness writes is wonderful. The other one is Gary Habermas. He calls his book The Thomas Factor, Using Your Doubts to Draw Closer to God. And so Habermas, by the way, you can go to Habermas, GaryHabermas.com, and he puts so much of his material there, and he talks about his own struggles that he's had with doubt. So he said, you know, we're dealing in this chapter here with the complaint that God should be more evident to us. Now he said, well, what do you mean by the divine hiddenness issue? He said, well, in some cases... A Christian is troubled by the sense that God is unavailable for direction or for consolation. He said, you see a lot of this in the Bible, laments and all. And he said, also, there's another sense where people who are not Christians decide there's just not enough evidence for the existence of God. They're skeptical. They're just not seeing anything out there that seems to be God showing up. So Grotheis is going to focus on two authors. And one of them, you won't be surprised. He's going to mention C.S. Lewis dealing with this issue. But he's going to spend more time with Blaise Pascal. So let's start with his comments uh, taken from Lewis. He said, you know, one of these issues is that here we are, finite creatures, trying to figure out the hiddenness of God. But God transcends things that we can conceive. And so he, he mentions, for example, Lewis says, I suspect there's something in our very mode of thought which makes it inevitable that we should always be baffled by actual existence. And he says, we're, we're finite, we're contingent beings, and we're trying to deal with a supernatural being. So, no wonder. And uh, then he spends more of the chapter with Blaise Pascal. And I thought this was a really interesting uh, point here. He says, Pascal says there's something kind of a paradox going on here when it comes to how much should God reveal himself to people. He said, if there was no, this is Blaise Pascal, if there was no obscurity, in other words, God not showing himself, man would not feel his corruption. He says, if there were no light, on the other hand, man could not hope for a cure. So Grotheis is saying, Pascal is telling us, If God were just obvious to everybody, people wouldn't feel their inadequacy and their need for grace and redemption. See, I hadn't heard of that one before. I thought that was an interesting idea. But he says, Pascal also says, if there were no signs of the deity, then we would know how corrupt and ruined we are. There'd be no reason to hope for any kind of grace or redemption. So he said, this is Grotheis now talking, that God's existence is intimated in creation, but not overwhelmingly obvious to everyone. It beckons, but it doesn't compel against. And Pascal goes on to say that people want to deny and suppress the truth in creation, that God actually is kind enough to allow our ears and to, and to, to shut our ears and to turn our eyes away. And he mentions the Apostle Paul in Acts 17.27 He says, God created the world and oversaw it so that people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him. And so uh, Grotheis lands on that word perhaps. People would seek him and perhaps reach out for him. So perhaps means we all could, but we don't. And he's going to argue in the rest of the chapter that when we deny God and say there's no God, there's a hidden God, he says that requires a lot of self-deception. He says, actually, God has given enough evidence of himself to induce belief. Then there's a third famous person that uh, Grotheis is going to interact with, and that's Friedrich Nietzsche. He said, there's been a lot of discussion over the last 30 years about the hiddenness of God. He said, let me interact with Nietzsche, since he presses that case strongly. He thinks, talking about Nietzsche now, thinks the notion of a hidden God is inconsistent with a God who holds us accountable for our belief. But he says, you know, Nietzsche objects under a false assumption. So he says, Nietzsche is saying, is if God's good, he's got to reveal himself so clearly as to leave no doubt, irrespective of their moral conditions. But he points out, Pascal argues that God is available for those who seek him, considering their own moral needs. God has left enough clues to make the search warranted. And so then uh, Grotheis says, well, what is it 
that would increase our knowledge. So if we're going to know and try to understand and reach out and grasp the idea of God, how do we do that? He said, well, it's the personal status of the knower, and it's reserved for people who properly prepare, investigate, and participate. Now, notice that's a very active situation. So uh, he's going to eventually talk about the atheist is not doing those things. He's not preparing, investigating, and participating. He's sitting back in many cases and saying, well, God can come to me if he wants to, which is not what's going to happen. He said, actually, the orientation of the knower matters so much. The person who's looking for God, quote, unquote, And he gives an example, a detective who is passionately concerned to find his lost son is going to sniff out every lead and follow up every clue, whereas a police agent who has no connection to the lost person is probably not going to do as as much good work. And uh, Pascal is saying, we need to seek out God because it's worth it. We have to believe that and we we have to be hungry for that. So he says, what are the virtues that best suits a person who's trying to gain knowledge? What traits taint a person's capability to gain knowledge? He said, we need patience, tenacity, humility, studiousness, and then here's the key, honest truth-seeking. On the flip side, what should we be avoiding if we're really seeking truth? Impatience, gullibility, pride, I think that's key. Vain curiosity and intellectual apathy. Yeah. So he let, let's get to the part where he talks about divine hiddenness and atheism. Because he said, the atheist comes up with a basic case. We'll do it as a uh, logical argument here. Number one, a deductive argument. Number one, if God exists and he's all good and all powerful, there would be no honest atheist because God would want people to know him. Nobody could be justified in their unbelief. There'd be, uh, it'd be obvious. Number two, there are honest atheists, but God hasn't revealed himself to these people, so therefore God does not exist. And then Grotai says, I will affirm number one, which is God is all-powerful, and if there was an honest, honest atheist, he would want people to know him. But what Grotai is going to argue with, that there are honest atheists, he says no. He says, no, there are none. And he says, look back at Romans 1. He said, the knowledge of God is available to everyone. And he believes the case for Christianity is strong enough for people that want to investigate, then everybody's accountable. He says, even Jesus assumed this. Here's a quote from John 7, 17. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So that shows the unbeliever is blameworthy for unbelief. Pascal said, There is enough light for those who desire only to see and enough darkness for those of a contrary disposition. That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? So besides Pascal, he said there are a lot of philosophers that have argued that God gives human beings a kind of intellectual freedom to follow up on the clues for God's existence or not. He says the case for Christianity is strong. It's a cumulative case. And uh, so he doesn't discuss that right now because that's been done uh, in his other previous chapters, things like the cosmological argument, the design argument, the argument for morality, and so on. He says also if they've, they've been doing studies in neuroscience that shows believing in God is an innate tendency. It's the natural position. So the atheist does not hold the natural position. That's actually unnatural. And he says, Atheism, atheism has been rare. and Most atheists once believed in God. Then he references a book that, again, I haven't read, but I've heard such good things about. It's called Faith of the Fatherless by a psychologist, Paul Vitz, V-I-T-Z. And uh, in his book, he talks about how the atheist became atheist because of poor relationships with their dads. So either the father was not there at all or he's abusive or something was unacceptable. And as a result, the atheist said, I don't want to believe in a God then, because they're associating God with their father. Um, He also says this, which again struck me as as fascinating. He said, a lot of what passes for atheism today is not. It's actually a hatred of a God that they know is there. I remember Frank Turek said, uh, he's had debates with atheists, and he said, 
for hearing them, he said, they seem to say, there is no God and I hate him. Okay, so I think that's fascinating. Grotai spends a lot of time then in the book of Romans, Romans 1, that shows that Paul prosecutes a case against humanity based on knowledge. Based on knowledge. God has made himself known. Invisible divine attributes like his power and his nature, they've been visible. They're clearly seen. Paul said people without excuse. We all knew that there was a God, but we should have commended him and should have turned to him as a creator, should have thanked him for life, but instead, what have we done? Many of us have traded that glory of the undying God for images of dying creatures, idols. We owe our existence to God, but we worship something else instead of the one that made us. That's that's so sad. And he said what happens is, for a lot of people, when they realize there is a God, they have a theological trauma of some kind, and they realize, oh, God is creator and I am not. I'm beholden to God. Well, at this point, a lot of people are very willing to bend the knee, aren't they? Or somebody may say, I don't want to do that. And they repress. It's a well-known psychological category explored by Freud as well as others. So you don't want something to be true. So you try to repress it and you try to substitute something else. So we say there's no God, but what do we do? We turn to anything else we can think of and make that our God. We can't live without worshiping something. So we get an alternative or a false object of belief. He gives some examples. He says Carl Sagan seemed to worship the cosmos. Um, He says the book of Romans then propounds a whole theology of self-deception and how that comes about. He says the atheist or skeptic sees general revelation but puts it aside and because of pride, which is the essence of all sin, rejects this. And it sounds a little bit like Thomas Nagel, the famous philosopher, he says, I don't want there to be a God. And uh, Pascal, once more, he goes back to Pascal. Pascal said, men despise religion and hope it's not true. And then uh, Grotheis says, again, something I've chewed on for a while. I thought it was an interesting point. He said, in one sense, Christianity is the easiest of all religions. You believe the gospel and are redeemed. It's all of grace. But he says, you know, in another sense, it's actually the hardest of all religions. You have to repent of self-righteousness. You can't get yourself into the kingdom of heaven. You're a rebel. You have to lay down your arms. You have to humble yourself before the cross. So in one sense, Christianity is an easy religion. In another sense, it's maybe the hardest of all religions. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. At the end of the chapter, I want to spend just a second on this. Grotheis tells his story. He was brought up in kind of a nominally Christian place, but his family didn't attend church very often. When he went off to college, he started studying Eastern religions and Western philosophy. and He was drawn to atheism through Marx and Freud, but he says especially Nietzsche. So he wanted to throw off conventional morality. And he said, he read Nietzsche, and Nietzsche basically said, assert yourself, you're a superman, it's a godless universe, suck it up, you got to go for it. So he poured over Nietzsche's writings like it was a holy writ. But he said, you know, being an atheist was difficult. I wanted there to be no God so I could be a God in this godless world. But he said, but when I beheld the beauty of the Rocky Mountains, which is where he was at the time, he said, I felt defeated. I had a strong sense that God existed despite attempts at atheism. So he he kept trying to suppress that sense of a deity. But he said, finally, my atheism ended up a glorious defeat. He said, God cut through my self-deception and showed me his saving truth and gracious love. So he said, by the end of the chapter, he said, you know, it's often people who are hiding from God and not God who's hiding from us. But he said, if we have a humble heart and an active mind, we can press into the reality that it's God himself and help lead others moving in that same direction. So this is the new book. I want to come back again and again myself, and I certainly will try to share another chapter or two with you later. Uh, Doug Grotice, Grotice, sorry, Doug Grotice. Christian Apologetics, second edition, beautiful book, a little pricey, and uh, you'll get a good workout lifting it, but uh, it's it's worth uh, getting a hold of. Maybe the single book, along with maybe I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Those are probably my two favorite single books on uh, apologetics.
Well, I thank you for uh, being with me. It's a little bit longer podcast than usual, but a lot of good stuff in this book. Thanks, and uh, we'll do another podcast really soon.